All right, I've seen enough. Three games in, I'm calling the league office, and I'm filing a missing report for the Sacramento Kings three-point shooting. Once again, their three-point shot nowhere to be found, but tonight, for the first time in this series, it really comes back to bite the Kings. Kings fall to the Warriors in game three. But believe it or not, it's not the three-point shooting as to why the Kings lost this game tonight. I'll explain right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all postseason long. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC Ten. And yes, Kings three point shooting. Where have you gone? This joke is for NBA 2K players and NBA video game players. It's like God has somehow turned down the Kings three-point shooting slider. For some reason, this team that is normally potent and lethal from three-point range, they cannot buy a three. Get this, for the series, the Sacramento Kings are 32 of 116. That's 27.6% in this series. Game one, Kings went 12 of 32. Now remember, they actually finished that game going 8 of 10 from three-point range. So it was a lot worse than 12 of 32 for most of that game. Game two, Kings go 9 and for, or nine for 38 from three-point range. No clue how they won that game. Oh, yes, I do. They won it on the defensive end by doing things that they didn't do tonight. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And then tonight, 11 of 47 from three-point range. Again, 32 for 116, 27.6% from three-point range this series. For a team that walked into this playoffs touting or, or, or wearing the mantle or the honor of having the best offense in NBA history, that ain't gonna cut it. Even if this team came into tonight shooting poorly, still up to nothing, that is not going to cut it. This is not a best of three series. It's not a best of five series. In a best of seven, you need to find your strengths at some point. And while the Sacramento Kings have found other strengths, other things to lean on to get them to this point, offense is their M.O. Offense is where this team thrives. And offensively, when they play with pace and are hitting outside shots, they can pull away and outscore anyone and everyone in the league. But here we are. The Sacramento Kings losing 114 to 97, the, the widest margin of victory in this series so far by a pretty significant margin. And it's because the Warriors pulled away from the Sacramento Kings in this game because the Kings couldn't buy a bucket. Whereas in games one and two, while the Kings did win, they were never, never able to create enough separation to feel comfortable because, again, they couldn't buy a bucket from three point range. The Warriors are just swarming the paint at this point, right? They are waiting for the Kings inside, whether it's DeMontis Sabonis attacking the basket, De'Aaron Fox attacking the basket, Malik Monk attacking the basket. It does not matter. The Warriors are meeting players, Kings players in the paint with two or sometimes three defenders to if nothing else, just contest a shot and force the Kings into leaving their feet and a, a wild shot at the rim or a bailout pass that tonight, more than the other two games, was resulting in turnovers, steals, and fast break opportunities for the Golden State Warriors. Look, the Warriors shot 40% from the field tonight, 32% from three-point range, and 78% from the field. If I told you the Warriors shot that percentage, not just in, a, in any game, but at home, you would have said, man, the Sacramento Kings have an amazing chance of winning this game, right? Everybody, even Warriors fans, Warriors media members would have said, yeah, you hold the Warriors to those kind of shooting splits, the Kings definitely have a chance to win the game, especially with how potent their offense is. But instead, the Kings hold the Warriors to those shooting splits, they lose by 17 points. Now, of course, a lot of that is the fact that the Kings couldn't buy a bucket from three-point range, but a lot of that also has to do with little important battles in the trenches that the Kings were winning with flying colors in games one and games two that they did not win tonight. It's impressive 
that the Kings are up 2-1 in this series to this point with how poorly they've been shooting. And this is why. They did not lose tonight's game because, because of their three-point shooting, believe it or not. They won games one and two because of what I'm about to share with you. And they lost tonight's game because of what I'm about to share with you. The Kings allowed 22 Warriors points off of 15 Kings turnovers. Now, <coughs> excuse me, for perspective, that is more points off of turnovers for the Golden State Warriors tonight in game three than in games one and games two combined. They had 14 points off turnovers in games one and games two combined. Five in game one, nine in game two. That is excellent for the Sacramento Kings to hold the Warriors uh, to, to that low of a number off of turnovers because the Warriors are so lethal when they get out in transition. They usually capitalize and really exploit mistakes of their opponents. Tonight, they did just that as the Sacramento Kings had their worst game taking care of the basketball so far in this series, and the Warriors took full advantage of that. But that's not all. We're talking wars, fights, these little dirty battles in the paint. 18 offensive rebounds for the Golden State Warriors in this game. 18 leading to, uh, let's see, 24 second chance points. That is, I mean, you're not going to win. It doesn't matter how well you're shooting. doesn't matter how poorly the Warriors are shooting. You give them that many second chance opportunities. You give them that many opportunities to score after missed shots. They are going to kill you. And the Warriors did that. Finally, the Kings were beat by other Warriors players who they, they've done a good job limiting in this series to this point, right? The Kings' depth has been so incredibly important so far, like Trey Lyles stepping up in game one. Malik Monk was excellent in game one and game two. Uh, Davion Mitchell was excellent in game one and game two. All three of those guys struggled tonight. Meanwhile, the depth of the Golden State Warriors showed up and came to play in a game where they were missing not just Draymond Green. Of course, we know how important Draymond Green is to this team. They were missing Gary Payton the second. The two best defensive players on this Golden State Warriors team and they held the Sacramento Kings still to 97 points without them. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Also speaks to, again, how poorly the Kings were shooting. But they allowed themselves to get beat by those other Warriors. And I don't say that with disrespect because these are important, impactful, great role players that the Kings have done a really good job limiting so far in this series to this point. Kevon Looney tonight only had four points, but 20 rebounds, 11 of them offensive, also had nine assists. Look. I was critical, critical of Kevon Looney coming into this series. Kevon Looney has been really, really good for the Golden State Warriors. A lot of Warriors fans told me that was going to be the case. I didn't necessarily fully believe it. And look, I covered Kevon Looney and this Golden State Warriors team when they won the championship last year against the Boston Celtics. I covered those NBA Finals, so I know how good Kevon Looney is capable of being. I didn't think he was going to be as good as he has been against the Sacramento Kings. He's been fantastic. Like, Draymond Green needs to buy Kevon Looney dinner or a very expensive bottle of wine or something because Looney made up for Draymond's la uh, 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 absence almost by himself. Kevon Looney was really good in tonight's game. Then you have former Sacramento King Dante DiVincenzo. Six points, seven rebounds, eight assists off the bench. I thought he came in and was like a spark plug. I thought he was to the Warriors tonight what Malik Monk has been to the Sacramento Kings in the first two games. He just came in. He brought energy on both ends of the floor. He was diving for loose balls. He was running the team really well at times. He was playing next to Steph. At, uh, most of the time, he was playing when Steph was getting a rest. By the way, Steve Kerr adjusted his rotation with Steph Curry in this game tonight. It seemed like a very similar to rotation to what Mike Brown does with De'Aaron Fox so that Steph Curry was one of the first guys to come out so he could finish uh, the first quarter, start the second quarter, get a break in the second quarter, finish the second quarter, and same old, same old to save himself, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for a big fourth quarter push. But Dante DiVincenzo did an excellent job maximizing those minutes. When Steph Curry was not in the game, that was a major X factor and major area for success for the Sacramento Kings in game one and two. They exploited when the Warriors did not have Curry on the floor. Tonight, the Kings couldn't create any separation or really make any ground, no matter who was in the game for Golden State. And finally, Moses Moody. 13 points in 16 minutes. Moses Moody has basically been a non-factor for the Golden State Warriors in these first two games. Tonight, steps up with an important 13 points off of the bench, including a couple of big buckets at times to stop uh, Sacramento's pitiful at time attempts at trying to uh, put together a run and work their way back into this game. 
I'm going to talk about Keegan Murray in just a second because I know some Kings fans are panicking about Keegan Murray. I'm going through a balance, and I'll share that balance with you right after this. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Ultimate Pro Basketball Jam. It's the coolest game I've played in a long time. I always thought it would be fun to be an NBA general manager. I always thought, hey, maybe I could do Monty McNair's job or Pete, uh, Pete D'Alessandro's job. Well, maybe that's, uh, that's, a, that's a bad example. I always thought I could do an NBA general manager's job, sometimes better than they can do it. Hell, I can do it on NBA 2K. Well, everybody knows that NBA 2K is not necessarily the most realistic, but Ultimate Pro Basketball GM gives you as realistic as a uh, NBA GM, basketball GM simulator as it gets. The game allows you to manage every strategic aspect of a franchise, playing through seasons and leading your franchise and fans to glory as you build a historic dynasty in a simulation. You're <laughs> responsible for like dealing with challenging personalities from your players uh, and your coaches, just like in real life, hiring the right coaches and assistant coaches, trading and training players, making draft picks, navigating your franchise through free agency, the draft, all the ups and downs of multiple seasons and the off season they have it all for you all in this challenging and realistic game world ultimate pro basketball gm is completely free and playable offline you can play on the go as you want and when you want to locked on kings listeners you can get a hundred percent free boost to their franchise when using the promo code locked on in the game store so make sure you check it out to download the game visit probasketballgm.com scan this code on your screen or look it up on app stores that's probasketballgm.com ultimate basketball gm start your dynasty today I find myself in a bit of a balancing act with Keegan Murray right now. There's an angel and devil on my shoulder. I'm, I'm sitting at the center uh, of a teeter-totter here, not knowing which way to go. Keegan Murray has struggled immensely in these playoffs. Tonight, six points, two of seven from the field, five rebounds. He made his first three-pointer of the series tonight, and it was a garbage-time three-pointer after this game was basically over in the fourth quarter. So here's what I'm balancing giving the rookie patience, given his circumstance, and we talked about this already, rookies are typically not asked to do what Keegan Murray is doing, having a prominent starting role on a playoff team with a high seed. Like, that doesn't happen, typically. So, give the rookie grace and patience and time for that, but also, I'm balancing that with, man, you got to give me something, right? So, I'll give you grace. I'll give you patience. Give me something to hang my hat on or to build off of at, at the very least in this playoff series. It's not that Keegan Murray is playing terrible. Like, I can't point to too many moments in this series, and I can't even think of one off the top of my head, where I've gone, oh man, Keegan Murray is just awful. Like, he's playing bad or getting exposed on defense, or he's just, his shot selection is terrible, or he's forcing and doing too much, blah, blah, blah. Like, there hasn't been a moment like that for me from Keegan Murray in this series. But he's completely disappeared like that's almost worse sometimes if I see you making mistakes at least I know you're trying at least I know you're playing hard there are, <laughs> there are times when number 13 is on the floor and you just don't notice it and then you look up at the stats and you see nothing and you see that he's played a five six minute stretch to start the game and all he has is foul trouble just like for example he had three fouls within the first five six minutes of this game here tonight to me and again I'm not a coach I don't know how to break this down for a rookie. I trust Mike, uh, Mike Brown and the rest of his coaching staff far more than I trust myself to handle this. But, like, simplify things. Know what you do. What you do is you space the floor, and at the very, very least, you hit threes. At the very least. And you're getting good looks. Keegan Murray has gotten good looks, just like a lot of players have gotten good looks. So I'm not going to single out Keegan Murray alone and say, man, you need to start hitting shots when guys like Harrison Barnes, I mentioned, are 4 of 14 in this series. Guys like Kevin Herter are 3 of 20 in these series. Like, There are other more prominent veteran players that are not hitting shots right now that the Kings need. So it's not singling out Keegan Murray. But to me, he looks like he needs things to be simplified. You do, If nothing else, do this. Space the floor hit shots, do what you came here to do that you didn't have to be taught. You were naturally gifted and naturally able to. Now, I know that the Golden State Warriors are doing their best to take those shots away. But Keegan Murray has had a lot of wide-open good looks in this series that just aren't falling. Again, not falling for a lot of people, not just Keegan. But if Keegan's not going to hit shots for you at this point, he's not giving you anything else. Kevin Herter at least has given me two-point buckets. Harrison Barnes gives me a strong veteran presence, and he's been there and done that before. I'm not getting anything else from Keegan Murray. So I need to see him <coughs> simplify things, hit shots, space the floor, and just ease into it that way. 
Here's uh, Mike Brown and De'Aaron Fox both talking uh, about Keegan Murray and his struggles. Well, not many, not many rookies are, in, <laughs> are starting for you know, a, a playoff team and playing a significant role like he is. So, um, you know, this is great for him to go through. Uh, we want him to stay aggressive. Uh, we want him to keep shooting the ball. We feel like he's getting some pretty good looks. Uh, they're just not going in, but um, I, I think they will go in. That's why we want him to keep shooting it and, and then try to play defense the right way and, and see if he can get out and get some easies in transition. So um, this is just really new for – it's new for a lot of our guys. I mean, this is really new for him, and, and uh, we, I mean, we love him. We got, we're going to have patience with him, and we're going to give him a chance to succeed. But uh, he's got to go through these growing pains in order to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, I, I continue to encourage him even throughout the game. Uh, it's difficult, especially for for a rookie who played big minutes for us all uh, all season. Um, I mean, he broke the three point record for a reason, so we know he's skilled. We know he can play. Um, obviously, the the physicality and everything has risen. The intensity of the game has risen, um, and he struggled a bit. But um, for us, we 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 need and we want him to get going, and uh, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna take that away from him. Sunday is not a must-win game. Like, let's not go that far. We don't have to be that extreme and absurd. Like, oh, the Sacramento Kings lose that game. They're, they're screwed for the series when they're in big trouble. But you essentially lose that game. You give the Warriors new life. You let them even the series up, and suddenly it becomes a best-of-three series against the defending champions. Granted, two out of those three games are, if, if you go all three, two out of those three games would be in your building. But at that point, your safety net is basically gone. Because you then have to win game five on your home floor, which I think the Kings are more than capable of. We're now guaranteed to get a game five in Sacramento, so that's exciting. I know Draymond Green, I'm sure, is going to get a wonderful uh, welcome back to Sacramento uh, in game five, assuming he doesn't do something stupid in game four and get suspended again. But the Kings have to win on their home floor if they lose game four on Sunday. Their safety net is essentially gone at that point, and... It would be more than fair to say, I think, even from the Kings' perspective and how good the Kings have played at times in this series at home, it would be more than fair to say if the Golden State Warriors even the series up two games apiece on Sunday, they move firmly into the driver's seat. Then it's back to the Kings to respond on their home floor. They're more than capable of doing it. Again, I'm not telling you that game four is a must win. If the Sacramento Kings lose that game, they're screwed because that's ridiculous. This Kings team has shown that we can believe in them. And the, the Golden State Warriors have to prove they can win in Sacramento before the Sacramento Kings have to prove that they can beat the Warriors in a best of three series, essentially. Right? I mean, that, that's, that's pretty self-explanatory based off of how this regular season and postseason has gone to this point. But you allow the Warriors to even up this series... Your safety net is gone. Your wiggle room is gone. And you're still in a series, in a battle, with a team that has been there, done that before, and you haven't necessarily. Sunday's game is going to be very interesting for a lot, a lot of reasons. Like I said at the top of the podcast, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Now, this app is fantastic. It's your best way to get tickets, truth be told, for the best prices. And uh, I'm actually using it tomorrow because... The Sacram or rather the San Francisco Giants, are hosting the New York Mets. I'm staying here uh, in San Francisco. I'll have uh, Kings media availability and everything in the afternoon and in the morning. So in the evening, I'm going to be free. My wife and I are going to go check out a San Francisco Giants game. I'm going on the Game Time app, and I'm already seeing amazing flash sales for tickets that are very, very close to the field for $20, $30, $40 less on average than these other apps. I'm seeing it for myself and taking advantage of it tomorrow for San Francisco Giants baseball here in the Bay Area. So give Game Time a try. They have amazing flash sales as the event gets closer and closer. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day, uh, day of the event. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price if you find tickets in the same section and row, uh, row for less. Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. You can snag tickets without the stress at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Before I wrap up, I want to talk about the uh, atmosphere here inside Chase Center a little bit. I've been in this building a number of times before, not just for like King Summer League basketball this past summer, but. I was here, like I mentioned earlier, covering the NBA Finals. That atmosphere was, was pretty ama uh, amazing. The atmosphere tonight was cool. 
It was good. There's a lot of noise that the Golden State Warriors made. But let me be very, very clear. And this is not homer bias. This is fact. This is reality. This place was nothing compared to the Golden One Center. It's a gorgeous building. The Golden One Center fan base is passionate. I'm sorry, the, the Golden State Warriors fan base is passionate. They're loud. They're fantastic. They're rowdy. They had fun. They had an impact on this game, no doubt about it. But the intro sequence, just the sheer volume in this building, it can't hold a candle to what you have done inside of the Golden One Center. Now, I understand this is round one for the Golden State Warriors. Maybe their fan base is a little used to making deep playoff runs, and maybe they don't get to their peak until they get to the Western Conference Finals or NBA Finals. Whatever excuse that they want to say, I'm telling you, from my experience, the volume level in this building was not anything near what I experienced inside of the Golden One Center. So if you want to take any kind of victory from tonight, uh, you, of course, can take that victory. Demonte Sabonis is not very well liked here in San Francisco. Like, he was booed relentlessly. Every time he touched the ball, booed. And he got some pretty loud boos, which is pretty hilarious. Like, for those who know DeMontis Sabonis, have gotten to interact with DeMontis Sabonis, he's one of the nicest guys on the planet. And, uh, like, he, we spoke to him at uh, pre- or shoot-around availability this morning, and Domas was sharing, like, he felt bad that he got stomped on and this became a story that took away from the Sacramento Kings, them what they've done to win games to go up 2-0, uh, De'Aaron Fox winning Clutch Player of the Year, Mike Brown winning Coach of the Year. The guy who got stomped on is feeling bad for being a distraction, while the guy who got stomped on has been made out to be this whiny villain who uses a basketball as a weapon. Yeah, that's the storyline coming in here to the, to the Chase Center today. Look, I get it. I guess DeMontis Sabonis is the King's villain. Okay. He does not deserve to get booed like he is, but if that's how Warrior fans want to treat him, that's fine. He didn't play well enough. A lot of the Sacramento Kings simply did not play well enough uh, in tonight's game, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that this game was officiated differently than Games 1 and Games 2. Now, let me be clear. The Sacramento Kings did not lose this game because of the officiating. They lost this game because they couldn't hit shots, and they lost this game for all the re reasons that I listed earlier, the second chance points, the points off turnovers for the Warriors, blah, 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 blah. What I mean by this game was officiated differently is, one, DeMontis Sabonis couldn't get a foul call to save his life. That's fine. They were letting a lot of things go in the paint. Mike Brown prepared the team for this. He prepared us all for this. He said that this game is going to be officiated different. That's what we expect. So it's not an excuse for the Sacramento Kings. They expected it to be different. They had to play through it. They were not able to do so tonight. What I appreciate is that at no point did we see the Sacramento Kings get angry, yell, lose their minds, complain about foul calls. I'm sure they had words to the refs at times or threw their hands up at times. But they didn't go to the level that we saw the Golden State Warriors and Draymond Green going to in Games 1 and Games 2, bitching and moaning and crying to the point where the organization and media and fan base was putting out such a cry of conspiracy theory that it actually had some sort of impact on how Game 3 was officiated. You're not going to see Kings fans doing that. You're not going to see Kings fans saying the only reason the Sacramento Kings lost this game is because of the officiating and there's a conspiracy and woe is me, blah, 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 blah. We deserve better. You're not going to hear Kings fans saying that. You're going to hear Kings fans saying, yeah, we didn't shoot the ball well enough. We didn't do what we needed to win. Okay, back at it. Let's get to work for game uh, four on Sunday. That's the difference right now, if we're being completely honest. But DeMonte Sabonis definitely was hacked a lot. I posted a picture on my Twitter account, uh, an image that USA Today took of him just getting clobbered by Jordan Poole in the side of the head. No foul called. Whatever. Is what it is. I'm glad that the Kings didn't allow the officiating to really affect them. They simply just got beat. They got beat by the defending champs on their home floor. It sucks. It's something that we can live with, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they bounce back in game four. I'm not leaving. I'm staying here in San Francisco Friday and Saturday covering King's practice, King's media availability. I'm going to try and do interviews and whatever I can get, do another podcast, at least one uh, during that time before Sunday. I'll be at Sunday's game, of course, do a post-game pod on Sunday, so I hope you'll continue to join me for all of that. Thank you so much for your support. Yes, the Kings dropped a playoff game, but it's their first playoff loss in 17 years, right? We can live with that. Kings are still up 2-1 in the series. A lot of series to be played. The Kings still are in the driver's seat. Sunday is a new day. Tomorrow is a new day. Let's see if the Sacramento Kings can find their shooting over these next couple of days off. Until next time, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to Locked On Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.